Okay, university is a time of great change. There's no doubt about that, right? Whether it be imposter syndrome, settling into a new environment, and also the fact that there's a massive step up from A-levels to medical school. Anyone that tells you otherwise is lying. In this video, we're gonna be giving you guys our tactics and strategies that we so wished we had known at medical school. Whether it be finances, whether it be study skills, whether it be knowing how to manage extracurriculars and social life, whilst at the same time you're juggling all these different identities. So, if you guys are new here, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe it means a lot to us and we hope you enjoy. For anyone starting at university, finance is a very valid concern and it can be especially difficult to navigate alongside trying to understand medical school. A lot of you will be aware of the support available in terms of student finance in which you receive tuition fees to support the cost of the education for the year and um, maintenance loans which are usually calculated from parental household income um, or the student's income and an X amount is given to support the cost of living. What we all wish we knew at medical school and what we wish we did is to start those applications early. A lot of these applications, especially at the beginning, require an initial uh, registration stage where the student makes an account, the parent or guardians also make accounts to support the student's application and so kickstarting that process is quite handy so that when application dates do open you're ready to apply fairly quickly. An important sort of running theme that will happen across university is that uh, some information you will know and ha will have available um, but a lot of the information you do have to proactively seek and um, where finances are concerned uh, it is important to look for that information especially where you may be uh, entitled to certain funding um, such as disability allowances um, if you have um, parents or guardians also supporting uh, other children that could be taken into account or if you're a carer for someone uh, you may be uh, entitled to additional funds as well. What students aren't so aware of is the um, existence of NHS bursaries which throughout your medical school career you'll become more aware of um, but NHS bursaries where uh, exist when you receive when you reach your clinical years of medical school which are usually the final two years of medical school and you get a shift from lowering your student finance uh, and sort of getting more of the support from NHS bursaries where they contribute to the tuition fees and also your cost of day-to-day uh, -day, uh, living now if you're in the unfortunate boat where um, these sort of avenues might not be uh, available to you and you may not meet certain criteria to apply for them um, it is important to be aware of uh, charities and organizations that could support you uh, while you're studying at medical school there is a very helpful website called turn to us where you put your information in including your age your occupation uh, your off postcode and all of this will help filter out charities that you uh, can be entitled to help from. Don't feel like you have to do all of that on your own and um, there are advisors at university who are specifically there for uh, financial support and conversations like that. In fact there may be a student finance um, department uh, within your university who you there may be an individual that you can book an appointment with and talk to them about how to sort of navigate uh, the uh, whatever year of university you're in um, with regards to finance specifically. One of the things I wish I knew before going to medical school was how to prioritise study efficiency over length of study time. So one of the first problems that I ran into was we were having so many lectures where we covered 60 slides worth of content every single day, every week. And I spent so much of my time watching these lectures, typing word for word every single thing that the lecturer said. And then that means I wasn't taking in the information, I was having to relook at things. And so what I did to kind of change that was I'd look at the lecture slides before I went into a lecture to have an idea of the topics that we were going to be covering. And also just really focused on what the lecturer was talking about, trying to understand it and take it in as we were going along rather than typing word for word because actually lecture slides have a lot of information on them and rather than retyping just things that are already illustrated on the slides to only note down the information that's really key so that it's starting to stick in my head already. I think that's another thing that is important is the idea of active recall, which I think I underestimated with medical school. 
like I said, we get so many lectures and we cover so much content than we've ever been used to before that to stay on top of the content so it doesn't become so overwhelming at the end when it comes to exam times and things like that is about really keeping up with the knowledge as you go along. Now, the classic thing that all medical students will say is Anki. Um, so if you don't know what Anki is, it's kind of a flashcard system that has an algorithm that um, gets you to repeat ones if you've struggled with them and has the spaced repetition. And if Anki is not into a thing, like personally, I don't like the color of Anki, the gray. I think it kind of blends into one. So I actually quite like using Quizlet just because of the different colors it stands out for me more, but it's really down to your individual study preferences. Um, so for example, my flatmate that's a medic loves doing Anki, whereas I do Quizlet. Um, and then that's another thing, I really think utilize your peers around you. I think when you say concepts out loud and you discuss them with people, it really helps you internalize it and see whether you do understand it and if you can recall it. So I really think studying with friends can be really productive for study time. And even if you've both gone to the same lecture and there's just one little thing you want to clarify, it can sometimes, you know, on the walk back from the lecture theatre, like don't be afraid to discuss with people some of the things that were, that had, that had maybe confused you a little bit um, because everyone's in the same boat at the end of the day. I, you know, if, well, if you struggled with a certain couple of slides, I can guarantee that other people were also feeling the same. So really, I think with a medical school and kind of, especially at the beginning, trying to get used to so much content being thrown at you, that um, prioritizing efficiency over time is the most important thing. Fostering a strong support network is essential. A strong social support network in medical school is crucial for your well-being and mental health. Having the support network built of your friends, family and peers can provide emotional support as well as help you manage the stress, the demands of the course and also maintain a healthy work-life balance. As people frequently say, medicine is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And that really demonstrates that you need to have a sustainable approach when it comes to your studies. And one key strategy in which I've been able to do this is to allot specific time to working, as well as ensuring that I have enough time for my hobbies and self-care activities. In addition, I'd encourage you to join clubs or any other societies that relate to your interests, because that helps you uh, meet other like-minded individuals. However, I appreciate this is a bit more challenging during a time on placement, but there are often ways in which you can overcome this. So for me, for example, I absolutely love CrossFit. And so whenever I'm on placement, I try and join a local gym box. And this is a great way for me to meet some of the locals and explore the local area. Either way, I'd say forming that strong social support network really is key for your mental and emotional well-being during the challenging journey of medical school. Should we do societies for fun or for our portfolio? Now, I think as medical students, we're very used to doing lots of different extracurriculars, like getting involved in lots of things to do with medicine, to show our kind of investment to get into medical school with things like our personal statements. And so the question is, do we continue this as we go through medical school? Now, in terms of getting lots and lots of things for a portfolio isn't really the main idea of medical school, I think. We really want to immerse ourselves into medicine and really find what we love. And so for some people that is joining the societies and joining the specialty societies, for example, like the neurology society um, and things like that to really discuss with your peers areas that you're interested in and topics that you're interested in that maybe in medical school they haven't had chance just yet to go into such detail with but I think the importance here is you're doing it for fun you're doing it because it's what you're interested in and I also think branching out into lots of other different extracurricular activities not necessarily just things that are exactly for a medical portfolio, for example, sports or drama or music. I think it's really good to interact with so many different people and to build your interpersonal skills and gain a lot of other 
values and skills from doing things that isn't necessarily medicine I really think helps us prepare to become doctors and um, can prepare for our portfolio just not in necessarily such a direct way. Mindfulness is a super powerful tool that you can use not only to maximize your well-being but also in terms of your productivity and what I mean by that is being aware of what gives you energy and also what takes away energy and then arranging your daily schedule to best maximize your strengths and minimize your weaknesses. For example you might find actually just reading books or reading textbooks in particular is something that's quite energy draining so thinking about other forms that you could use to supplement that whether it be video recordings of lectures whether it be YouTube videos or whether it be in terms of uh, thinking about other ways in which you can actually supplement your revision as well so that would be my top tip so first be aware of what gives you energy and what takes away energy from you but it's also a case of then also noticing if you're feeling quite drained again and again and if you're feeling it within a day my top advice would be just to push through that because the chances are that's just procrastination but if you find day after day you're still feeling quite tired quite exhausted you're having sort of brain fog then it might be a sign that you need some time out and that you want to have more things that you can enjoy that can give you energy for example exercising socializing focusing on the basics like food as well so being aware of where you are in terms of your fuel, like as if it's like a car, and being aware of that so you can best top that up would be my top tip. So being aware of your energy levels is really important when it comes down to mindfulness. If you'll be commuting to university, you may be wondering how best to use your time effectively, whether to sleep, whether to study, and the best advice looking back is to be realistic about your surroundings and consider whether you can study efficiently or not. Think about the length of your commute, if it's quite a short commute, you may benefit from doing some situation-based questions or active recall. And if it's a longer commute and you've got the capacity to bring out a laptop or an iPad, uh, you can catch up on some lectures, uh, you can do notes that are pending and or read on whatever you're going into university for. Additionally, you could uh, watch some YouTube videos on topics that you're struggling with. Um, you can listen to medical podcasts or you can listen to medical notes that have an audio option available. And it's quite important to vary and think about what you can do on your commute because it may be very different to how you study within the day or when you're at home or a library and so it's important to adapt to the environment that you're in and consider the options available to you so that you are able to make use of your time um, while you are commuting. Now we have our phones all the time and we can download apps that allow you to go through questions and a lot of these can be done offline as well including PassMed and QuizMed among many others and if you do get things wrong and you feel like oh I need to jot that down you've got other apps like Anki where you can put in your flashcard for the day. Now commuting can also be a very difficult process in terms of fitting into university life and um, a lot of students might feel left out and might feel like they're not actually fully immersed in the university as a result of needing to come and go um, from home and go back in the evenings and to combat this again as with most things in medicine proactively sort of taking part in societies and engaging with your peers uh, and if you do make friends with people there are opportunities to stay with them sometimes and um, be able to make your links and your networking through uh, those avenues. So we're now going to talk about mental health and knowing when and how to ask for help when needed. I think medicine is often associated with very high workload and burnout that can often lead to low mental health and I think it's really important that as medical students and to help our peers that we know where and how to reach out for help. Quite often at medical schools there will be a specific welfare specialist. Um, we, you can talk to your tutors, you can talk to peers um, and obviously the GP is um, probably your first port of call if you feel that you would like and need some help. I think for me, one of the things that has been very helpful when I've been struggling with low mental health at medical school is really talking to my peers. I think sometimes it can get quite isolating and quite lonely when you feel, when all the work's piling up and you can start to feel overwhelmed. I think just talking to um, lots of your peers that are probably going through a similar situation, it can really, you know, boost your mood. Um, things like study groups or talking groups and just really showing and 
encouraging everyone to talk about mental health I think should really be pushed within medical community because I think sometimes people just think low mental health happens because of the workload and and is typically associated with medicine and want to really emphasize that there is help out there there are people that are going through the same thing and similar things to you and that you deserve someone to talk to you and that you really should reach out if you need help and that should really be encouraged Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is placements and depending on your medical school you'll either be starting clinical placements in first year, second year or fourth year like me at Oxford University. So what I want to talk about here is about being proactive and about being realistic. It's all about being proactive as opposed to being passive and the best thing to do is approach the junior doctors and as we know junior doctors could be FI1s, FI2s, registrars in core training, it's anyone that's not a consultant and they're going to have the most time out of anyone where they can actually go through and teach you some stuff whether it be case-based learning, whether it be bedside teaching or whether it be like interpreting an x-ray or giving you small tasks to do like taking a history from a patient or taking bloods. On that line of actually taking bloods, definitely definitely make best friends with nurses because they know how the whole place works and also they'll be able to give you some of the best clinical skills that you ever receive uh, in terms of teaching from those nurses so definitely befriend them and listen to them because they're just a bundle of knowledge and they'll tell you everything you need to know really um, and also be realistic about what you want to do in that day and try and have a daily highlight of one thing you want to see you want to clock one patient and you want to be able to present it to the consultant so definitely be realistic with your time but definitely be proactive and make the most out of it because there can be a lot of dead space in clinical school and in clinical placement so it's important to be able to make the most out of it. So we're now going to talk about part-time jobs as we know uh, the cost of living is rising, student loans aren't rising, um, often part-time jobs do become part of your life as a medical student particularly as we are here for maybe five to six years without a steady income stream and I think part-time jobs are actually a really good way to improve our communication skills, our interpersonal skills. Um, and I know people that have worked in retail, that have worked in, say, a pub or even tutoring. Um, and actually even working as a healthcare assistant, particularly in holidays back at their local hospitals, which is a really good way to get um, clinical experience and confidence. But I think the really important thing is time management with part-time jobs is realizing that medicine is a lot of work, but with good time management skills, organizational skills, and learning when to prioritize certain things that a part-time job can actually be quite beneficial in terms of having a break, having that kind of separation from medicine and can often give people kind of that extra bit of energy that they need instead of it just feeling like it's medicine, medicine, medicine and that breaking it up and doing things that you really enjoy, which can be say a part-time job working as a waiter in a restaurant can really be quite a nice side experience. <laughs> And lastly, most importantly, do what works for you. Be reflective, be proactive and find out and be mindful of what works for you and what doesn't. There's gonna be a fair amount of experimentation along the way. So just switch up and see what works. Do those experiments and make those small iterations on a daily basis. And that 1% each day just absolutely adds up. So thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. If you have found it useful, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and we'll see you in the next one. Take care guys.